Hello and welcome. I'm Sam Robinson, psychotherapist in Austin, Texas. I'm here today with Donna Martin as a part of a series of interviews with expert practitioners of different forms of experiential psychotherapy. In this series, we interview a wide variety of experiential practitioners so as to compare and contrast the thinking and techniques of different experiential methodologies. Donna has an extensive background in teaching both the Hakomi method and yoga and now teaches an original approach to therapy that she calls SOMA. A SOMA practitioner supports another's healing through presence, self-reflection in embodied mindfulness, and the transformational discovery of new possibilities for how to organize experience in creative and nourishing ways. Donna has written several books, including Seeing Your Life Through New Eyes, The Presence of Loving Presence, sorry, The Practice of Loving Presence, Embodied Mindfulness, The Hakomi Way, Psychotherapy is Spiritual Practice, and SOMA Yoga Therapy. She teaches several online groups and has an annual retreat at Hollyhock Retreat Center on Cortez Island, British Columbia, called SOMA, the heart and soul of therapy. Sounds delightful. Donna, great to have you here. Let's let's jump right in. I'd love to hear about SOMA and, and yeah, and how it's experiential and, and all of that good stuff. Thank you, Sam. It's it's delightful to be here with you. Uh I love talking about this, and uh, hopefully, because we're both interested in experiential practice, uh, we'll do some experiencing as well, or I'll point at how we might experience uh, self-awareness and the way we organize experience. Experience is organized by habits, as you know, and by the state of the nervous system. That's by our embodied state. Um, I worked for 20 years very closely with Ron Kurtz, who was the creator of the Hakomi Method, as you know. And he was really interested in states of mind, he called it. Um, both of us had been influenced by both Hakomi practice, uh, by yoga practice, I should say, in their approach to Hakomi, and by Feldenkrais. Um, you might know something about Feldenkrais. Feldenkrais, uh, Moshe Feldenkrais was an Israeli uh, genius who developed a way of working with the body that he called awareness through movement. And uh, I mentioned Feldenkrais a lot because Hakomi really is informed by Feldenkrais. Feldenkrais is a, a totally somatic way of working um, with habit patterns in the body and how they're limiting us and how they can um, come into consciousness and then with the kind of experimental movements, not exercise per se, but moving with awareness, uh, the body naturally starts to transform. And Ron Kurtz took a lot of these principles from Feldenkrais and from uh, yoga and from Buddhism and brought them together in his way of working with people in a psychotherapy context. So my work now called SOMA is really informed by Hakomi and also by Feldenkrais and yoga. Wow. I'll, take a, I'll, I'll come up for air and let you say something here. No, it's great. I mean, the things that are jumping out is really the sense of uh starting with this body experience like right away there isn't even a like um a, a, a cognitive place to start from it's like yeah you're even with the yoga and the buddhism and that kind of thing it's really starting with the the body which sounds like how what was a logical step for you into hakomi and that kind of thing it was i was i met ron kurtz actually when we were both teaching at the retreat center you mentioned hollyhock which is on the west coast of Canada, and uh, it was kind of uh, inspired by Esalen uh, more than anything else, is still operating, um, brings amazing presenters from all kinds of different traditions to teach retreats, in usually in the months between April and October, because the winter on the west coast of Canada is quite wet. <laughs> so... Uh, I was teaching yoga there. He was teaching Hakomi. And I read his book knowing that he was coming. And his book was called Body-Centered Psychotherapy, which appealed to me as a yoga teacher and as somebody who had discovered that 
the main way that people seem to be benefiting from yoga, what I was teaching, was um, helping them to handle stress. It was actually um, as a stress management expert that I uh, became interested in psychotherapy because I began to see how people using self-awareness and and mindfulness, but embodied mindfulness and somatic self-awareness could begin to not only recognize the habitual ways, the knee-jerk reactive ways that they were responding to situations, which was exacerbating the stress and the distress of their experience, um, but by bringing awareness to how they were organizing habitually and then experimenting with other possibilities, um, they, they could transform literally. They could change and transform uh, the way they re respond, the way we respond to life situations and to people and places and situations that would otherwise be stressful, distressing or cause suffering. And I became totally convinced that it's self-awareness that is the ground for this kind of this kind of healing. And that's what got me interested in psychotherapy. Uh, I was already had already begun a, a master's program when I met Ron Kurtz, um, but I started a training in Hakomi at the same time. So it really became the paradigm for me uh, and the practical application of of everything that I'd learned from not just yoga but a whole variety of stress management techniques I had also worked in the field of addiction for many years working with substance abuse and uh, I loved working in that field because I used to tell it, particularly the people that were there in recovery from their own substance abuse and addiction that uh, it was they were further along the path than somebody who like off the street came in for psychotherapy who was blaming everything outside them for their distress um, someone in recovery from alcohol or substance abuse for example comes in knowing that it's their own habits that are causing their suffering so i would tell them they're they're one step ahead already and the willingness to look at themselves and and how that habit is um, on one hand trying to serve them but on the other hand causing suffering uh, this is really the platform for uh, the my approach to psychotherapy yeah it sounds great it's um <clears throat> what you just shared about the sort of um um how the the habit is on some level like coherent and and necessary and helpful but on another hand of destructive is kind of a really non-pathologizing perspective of someone's habit like oh yeah on some level this makes sense also it's having this impact on your life so let's like look at how to manage stress differently starting with the body and it seems like one of the questions I had was how you started your career and it sounds like yoga and seeing the impact that had on people's stress was really your way into like oh people could heal in this way and it sounds like Hakomi perhaps gave you like more of a way to conceptualize and frame the work is that, that right that's very accurate uh, I'm glad you used the term pathologizing and non-pathologizing it was one of the things that attracted me to Hakomi more than anything else Hakomi uh, and and Soma, which is my version of Hakomi, really, and puts it together with yoga and uh, a little bit even more attention to the body and somatic experience than than Ron was doing. Uh, but what appealed to me more than anything was how respectful this approach is, how how it trusts in the inherent an intrinsic wisdom of the person that we're working with and how it trusts in what I had been calling for years, uh, healing as remembering wholeness. You know, uh, Hakomi is founded on um, what they used to describe as five principles, which I think are also the, the 
you know, form the paradigm really of the SOMA approach. Um, and, and the first principle is unity, and which of course is also what the meaning of the word yoga is. And for me, it's it points at uh, how there is, we can think of unity as wholeness when it comes to healing. And the way I've described it in, in uh, my writing is that wholeness is a verb, as you know. I mean, wholeness is a noun, healing is the verb. So if healing is the verb of wholeness, then healing must be wholeness happening. Not, not a return to wholeness, not a recovery of wholeness, but wholeness is happening. And, and Ron Kurtz and Hakomi uh, works in a way that collaboratively um, accompanies somebody on a journey of becoming more and more conscious of this unfolding of their own intrinsic wholeness. And I find that not only non-pathologizing, but incredibly respectful. Yeah, it's so, <clears throat> so empowering too, to be like, yeah, you, the client, have the wisdom and we're going to go on this journey together to um, bring about wholeness. And I wonder if wholeness, could you refer to that as integration too, like an integrated bringing this stuff from the unconscious that you, only you, the client, know about into your consciousness is like, I don't know if that's how you could frame it too, or. Well, integration is very connected with wholeness, actually, as the the unfolding of wholeness moves toward integration. And I love that you brought that up. And uh, I, I'm noticing, by the way, uh, how satisfying it is talking to you, Sam, because you, you have um, a... Uh, tendency to lean forward and to nod and and your presence is really affirming you know it's a really inviting and presence is the beginning point of this creating the relationship to support somebody's unfolding and that respect comes through in the way somebody is present and you're being present with me in that way right now good yeah it feels hard not to be to be honest so <laughs> thank you for making it easy um yeah I, I love it yeah thank you for saying that um I love the um yeah again the respect the wisdom of the client the presence I wonder if um because this is yes yeah this is sort of making sense kind of on a conceptual level I want I wonder if there's like a an example you would have of like how you would work with someone coming to see you for soma therapy well, we kind of started there with that last exchange. The the starting point, and while I was working with Ron Kurtz in the last 20 years of his life, he really began to uh, use as a foundation for his training uh, this quality of presence that we want to be be when we're with another person and we want it to become our what he would call our primary task uh, it in uh, Hakomi um, Ron Kurtz spoke, uh, coined the term loving presence and he and I actually wrote a book on the practice of loving presence it became the foundation of the training I, in Soma I like to just refer to it as presence with a capital P and beginning by me if if I were the therapist and you were the client for example and um, just really taking in how you're relating to me uh, and I want to take in particularly those aspects that I perceive that when I see them feel nourishing for me so it it sounds kind of radical when we're talking to people who are therapists to say, what if your first task when you're with somebody is to find a way to be nourished yourself? What happens is you 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 start off perceiving the person as a source of inspiration and beauty. You, you see whoever you're with in a way as a gift. The, the opportunity to be present with somebody is a gift. 
and an honor. And that changes our state of mind. Uh, I, I feel like I named it for you because you you were you're naturally in that state. Uh, and I'm not sure if you're conscious of it or have worked with it, but there's a way that when it's not a habit, you know, if uh, therapists have been trained or people just have a tendency to look for problems or to wonder what they should do for the person or what needs changing, <clears throat> that's, that's a certain state of mind that has an impact on the relationship and on the other person. And so our, our starting point is, is exactly what you've started with and what I'm doing and talking about right now, which is enjoying, enjoying being with the person and being in a state which is, because it's a, an energy field we're creating, it's, it's really inviting for the other person to come forth, to come forward. Yeah, I, I imagine that's really, well, what a pleasant and rewarding position for the therapist to start in, instead of like, oh, I'm looking out for all the signs of pathology here and the things that are wrong with this person. And, oh, yeah, this is a, you know, disordered pattern of being rather than what's the like, twinkle in this person's eye that I can see and be with and be like, wow, this is really wonderful. And then I imagine the client feels accepted, eaten, comfortable enjoyed I mean to feel enjoyed by someone too is like such a wonderful place to start of like oh good yeah I'm not okay I'm not just a depressed person I'm mm -hmm. I'm a human worthy of of connecting with it sounds beautiful place to start and I'm, I'm curious how that would even look like you know does a do you do you explain to a client we're just going to sit with each other and we're going to observe and just see what comes up between us. Or does the client share, Oh, I'm having this problem in my life and you start there. Or how does that look? Mm -hmm. And you know, it can look either of those ways, many different ways. And, and you work with people. So, you know, sometimes people will come in and they're in distress and they want to tell you about it. And uh, they're, they're organized with a story usually uh, how I might work differently than many other therapists is I'm paying more attention to start with, uh, with what is inspiring me about this person. What can I see that seems right? What's already a resource that this person seems to have? And if it's a first time client, I, I might be imagining it, you know, but I'm looking for it. And that's what makes a difference. And I'm starting off in this place of seeing what about being with this person feels like it's going to be nourishing for me. Uh, we, we keep coming back to this word nourishment, but it's the best one I can come up with. And, you know, that state of mind is kind of reflected to the person. As, as you said, you know, they, they begin to get that not only are you not looking for what's wrong, there's there's a, there's a an appreciation of whatever's coming forward. Uh, they don't need to be selective about what they're giving you. Some some clients will come in and feel like they need to be select selective about giving you their problems, <laughs> and you know that's welcome. But everything else is welcome too. So we want to sit in this place of. Uh, receptivity really it's a receptive this this loving presence what Ron called presence loving presence and I'm calling presence isn't a you know I'm loving you state it's really I'm taking you in and if I'm going to take you in it's going to feel good to me so I'm looking for what it is that helps me feel good if you if you start with a problem um yes I'm listening to the verbal story but mostly I'm tracking you know, how you're organized somatically, because that is my main way of getting information, as it was for Ron Kurtz in Hakomi. And he was a, absolutely amazing at getting uh, information, and which turned out to be pretty accurate most of the time, by observing the person, how they organized somatically, how they organized to to sit, to the facial expressions, the gestures, the posture, all of those nonverbal 
uh, signs that tell us more than anything they could say in words what they're actually experiencing right now. And what we're interested in in, in in this approach is what's happening right now? What's here in present present experience? So part, part of what I'm noticing with you, for example, is as I'm speaking, you seem to be getting what I'm saying because you're nodding away there. And uh, the other thing that, that is interesting about what you seem to be doing, which I wonder if it's habitual, is is a kind of rocking movement Are you aware of that a little bit yeah i'm also very aware i wrote down here very aware of my own non-verbal cues right now <laughs> <laughs> seeing as you're explaining that the methodology is like about seeing that stuff but yeah i mean i, I don't I, I don't know if that's a I'm not super con I know I can feel that I'm doing it but I'm not thinking oh I'm rocking back and forth now I think I'm like engaged and I, it's almost like I'm I'm flowing as I'm nodding instead of just sitting still and nodding my head you know what I mean well and and that's exactly what we're looking for and of course our contract isn't for me to do therapy with you so but I'm uh, I'll I'll take advantage of your good heartedness and welcoming attitude to, to point out a few things, the way we would do it if we were working together in uh, SOMA or, or Hakomi uh, or SOMA yoga therapy even. Uh, what I'm looking for is how is the person, first of all, how does the person inspire me? That's a starting place. And then secondly, what are the signs of present experience? You know, and, and your nodding uh, tells me that you're listening or suggests to me that you're listening and you're interested and you're kind of getting what I'm saying. One of the respectful aspects of this approach, which is true for Hakomi and really important in Soma, is that we're observing, but we know any impressions we're getting are just that, impressions. We're we're guessing, we're allowing ourselves to guess. And the reason we allow ourselves to guess is that we will test our guesses with little experimental uh, experiences that not only will let us know if we're guessing correctly, but will help the person understand something about themselves. So I love it that you became aware of, of the movement back and forth, but it wasn't something you were doing intentionally or even thinking about at all. Uh, because that's exactly the kind of thing that if someone is curious about it, uh, and certainly if, you know, if you had come in and started telling me about some issue you were dealing with, um, I would guess that something that uh, jumps out at me that's that's somatic might be connected might might reveal something about how you organize experience and that might be part of why you're distressed by something mm -hmm. yeah that makes a lot of sense i was i have a couple of questions about that i'm what trying to write i'm trying to write it all down <laughs> what do you say only two <laughs> no well actually i've got yeah i've got many um yeah i so your sense is we, the so part of it is you're making you're not trying to interpret it's like a it's like a, an an impression and the way you test it out is do you verbalize it to the client or do you mirror their behavior or you just notice out loud well like you did with me like i notice when you do this you do this and have a sort of curious openness to it or how does the yeah folding into that experience happen well as you can imagine um pointing at it needs to be done at the right time in the relationship um i want the person first of all who comes to me to understand that this is a a method that is a, a self reflective self-study self-discovery approach that we're looking at what are the unconscious habits and ideas that are organizing 
the way you're experiencing things. And so I'm going to ask for permission to watch for and, and bring to your attention something that might be a habit that might be informing how you're experiencing something that's challenging for you. And so that's the first thing. There needs to be a certain quality of per permission. And I have seen people learning the method and practicing with each other who prematurely point out something. Do you realize you're rocking forward and back as you talk to me? And and it's and then it, you know, it lands in the wrong way. It it seems critical or judgmental if it's not timely. And if it's yeah, not well, offered with curiosity. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine it feeling too soon. You know, if you're settling into an experience and suddenly you're like, oh, I noticed you just looked up and left when you said this word. Yeah. Client might be like, whoa, all right, chill out. We're just getting to know. This is, <laughs> this is new. Um, yeah, yeah, so... so yeah. And it might it might take a whole session, you know, with a new client to feel like you've got enough safety and enough connection and enough um, a kind of curiosity more than anything uh, mm -hmm. for it to be timely to to point out something. Um, so it, that's that's a starting place is to is to feel like you've got a connection with the person that you're enjoying the person that they can feel that you're happy to be with them. They begin to feel safe. They begin to open up and they begin to get curious about themselves. So this is like a felt sense on the therapist part rather than do I have permission now? Have we sat here long enough for me to be able to? <laughs> it's like you can feel them heart opening more, settling in and you're like, oh, okay, I can feel that it's now okay for me to interject or suggest um, make a remark on my impressions of this experience right and we're so we're paying attention to to lots of nonverbal signals all the time and uh, for example like right now you've got this little bit of quizzical look you've got a little bit of a furrow in your brow and and so i i get that not only you're you're seeming interested but you're getting curious and, and quizzical about some of what I'm talking about here, but some of it's landing too. I, I think that you're resonating with some of what I'm saying, especially the respectful and non-pathologizing part. I, I'm, uh, have, I'm, I'm getting a real sense that that's the paradigm you're wanting to come from as well. Yeah, yeah. And when I say something like that, that, that feels good to you, doesn't it? You kind of uh, soften and smile. And I mean, I'm saying things now that I wouldn't say out loud to a client, but just telling you what I'm noticing and how I'm um, getting that kind of information of how how much further can we go? Yeah. I I, might I yeah. What'd you say? Sorry. I, I might, I might a a ask permission uh, because... The, the next phase after we've got the relationship in place is the self-study phase. And we use, Hakomi calls it little experiments in mindfulness for self-discovery. And, and that's how I'm organizing this middle phase, let's say, of a session or a journey with someone is, uh, can we begin to explore some of the, ways that you're organizing experience by using a little experiment and uh, for example it might be um it might be as simple if if i notice a movement like the rocking that i noticed is just to have you do it mindfully slowly and mindfully that might bring up a uh, a, a memory or an image or an insight of some kind or it remind you of something or it's an as if. Um, I, I might say, you know, I, I'm noticing something and I wonder if it'd be okay with you if we do a little experiment with it. It's a kind of asking permission and checking the timing. And here's my idea for the experiment is uh, this movement that you're doing might be habitual, might have meaning or not, but we we might find out something if you just, without speaking, just slowly and mindfully 
do the movement intentionally see what happens you know you know i'm doing it right in my mind I know. Just, <laughs> you know and it's funny and as you're saying that you know i am like oh yeah there is like this soothing quality to this rocking motion you know yes. which probably has a childhood origin to it i'm sure of like oh i'm you know which maybe then i'm thinking oh maybe it's because i want donna to feel comfortable and i'm i'm anxious about that but if i can stay in a soothed place i can remain present with her and make sure i'm engaged mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's that's exactly the kind of thing, you, you know, you, you notice the soothing quality. And Sam, you can probably discern a difference between the, well, I notice a soothing quality to this and the thoughts that go, well, maybe I'm trying to help Donna feel better and maybe it's connected with childhood. That's cognitive. Yeah, yeah. And this part is the experience, and, and that's welcome too because there are ideas that we could also check out, but we check it out experientially. We're not trying to mm -hmm. figure it out cognitively. So we'll use ideas that show up, but mostly we're interested in letting experience, the experience of something. If you're in a kind of curious and just um, wondering, reflective, mindful, way of paying attention uh, an, another kind of experiment is and and i usually don't do it first i'll tell you why in a moment another kind of experiment is to not do what you're doing what if you were to carry on the conversation for a minute or so and intentionally not do that movement then you might discover something about how it's serving or what it means yeah i don't like i don't like not doing it <laughs> you just tracked it out <laughs> yeah yeah and you can see you can see there's uh, something about this uh let's just see what happens if this this uh uh invitation to experiment this is not about correcting anything it's not about making anything happen so not, not about doing something else because it's better than what you're doing. It's just about really trusting that what is showing up in present experience, in embodied experience, experience is embodied. That's the, the, the foundation for this whole approach. And, and there's something about what we're doing bodily, unconsciously, that's informing how we're experiencing relationships and life and um, the world and 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 moment to moment events and the more we can bring it into consciousness the more choice we have if it's unconscious it's just on automatic and the way we bring it into consciousness i, I think what i love about this respectful quality to this work and this uh, non-pathologizing approach is it's really collaborative, first of all. It, it really relies on having this kind of relationship where we're socially engaged, we're both feeling safe enough to be curious. And we're, we're willing to explore something just to see what, if anything, that's what we like to say what let's see what if what if anything happens you know maybe nothing's going to happen or nothing's going to show up but let, let, let's do it in 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 this mindful way and just see what we discover and we're uh, we're we're discovering in this approach we're discovering uh two categories of things uh, which i'll say because at some point you're going to say, well, what, what's, what does healing look like? What's the point of this work? Uh, the first thing we want to discover is what's unconscious and habitual. What am I doing habitually? And it'll relate to my history, uh, but I don't need to go digging for that. I don't need to hear stories about that because it's going to show up in how I'm organizing experience now. And it shows up in embodied ways and the somatic uh, elements 
of how we organize experience give us direct access to the unconscious. And so we want to discover habits because as long as it's unconscious and habitual, it's on automatic and we keep repeating the same experiences or the same kinds of experiences over and over. But the other category of discovery that we're looking for and that's possible here, and it's interesting how, how much more possible it becomes with the uh, increased awareness of the first category. So the more I'm aware of what I'm doing, the more I can discover what else is possible. And so I, we think of healing as wholeness unfolding, wholeness happening. And in a way, it's like the world opens up. Uh, the who, who I am and what the world can be for me it expands with new possibilities. And that comes really directly and not by looking for something else because it would be better, but by staying with present experience, experientially exploring it with curiosity and something about bringing um, what we're doing more fully into consciousness opens the door for what else. Yeah, it sounds really powerful. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so curious about, so it's really you're working with the implicit mind or memory, which is more obviously more somatically based than like the autobiographical, oh, when I was a kid, this happened. I'm curious how you, like as a client is like feeling into stuff somatically and bringing it to consciousness, are, are they just explaining what's happening somatically without assigning any meaning of like, oh, this is about that thing that happened when with dad or, or you know, whatever. Is it more about, yeah, well, I notice that let's see if we can stay what's happening right now in the system and stay with that. Is that what the, the work looks like rather than well, what, what's the meaning of this thing that happened to you and how did it, you know, what's, what's it mean now and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we stay with experience and experiencing without trying to figure it out, but the meaning will emerge at some point from the experiencing in consciousness. Uh, and, it, and it may not emerge in the, in, in the midst of the session. It might not emerge till later. But what my focus is with somebody is assisting them to just stay with and study and actually report um, because there's something about not just um, mindfully noticing one's own experience, but actually reporting it to another who's a witness, who's the right kind of witness, that actually enhances, and research shows this, enhances all the benefits of mindfulness, being able to verbally articulate what you're noticing. Um, that's the ancient Vipassana practice, meditation practice, insight practice, which is just you know, naming present experience moment to moment. And, and there's enough research now that's been done pretty recently, though, not, not much longer than, uh, at least in, in Western science, than uh, the, the 80s. You know, it was in the mid 80s, actually, that uh, somebody did uh, some research that actually demonstrated how experience changes the brain. And they did it first with rats. <laughs> but that's pretty recent, you know, the whole field of neuroscience is very recent. But uh, Ron Kurtz was trained as a scientist before he ever became a psych psychotherapist. And he had a very scientific mind and that really appealed to me as well. So this, this is really a scientific approach. It's uh, make observations and and make some guesses about it and test the guesses, test the hypotheses with experiments and then collect the data. And, and we do this collaboratively with the client. So they're noticing things, they're observing and they're having uh, discover, making discoveries 
in the meaning and the conclusions, you know, if you remember doing scientific method in school, <laughs> the conclusions come out of collecting enough data that it just makes sense what this means. Um, but we don't jump to that too soon. We want to use experience and trust experiencing to reveal meaning. Um, for right. example, <laughs> you know, one of the things that you uh, recognized as a quality of the movement, the rocking movement, is this kind of soothing. And almost always, and you'll notice as I'm sure when you're working with people, um, at some point there's a self-soothing uh, gesture that happens. And, you know, people will put their hand somewhere, you know. Uh, it's just very, very natural that we do that. And when we can observe how the body is organizing in a way that might be self-comforting, bringing attention to that somatic experience um, can invite understanding to show up very naturally. So I'll give you a really simple example of something we do in our trainings. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to do if you're in in-person group, but it can be done even on Zoom, um, imagining. Um, but if we were in an in-person group, we would have people pair up and one person invite the other person to put a hand somewhere on their back that they think it would feel good. The partner does that. So this is a, really gives people a, a, an example, a taste of how we work collaboratively in this approach. Um, we rarely do in our trainings uh, until the third or fourth year, the role playing where someone is a therapist and someone is a client. We have people be the person and the partner, and then they switch roles. So the person is says, I think if you put your hand just behind my shoulder blade, between my shoulder blades, then the person does that, the partner does that. And the person wants to go into the experience of that and see, does that feel just right? Actually a little more pressure, or actually what if you put both hands? Or, or maybe just put your hands a little higher. It's experience that helps the person tell the partner exactly what's needed. And when it feels just exactly right, then we want them to stay again, continuing to mindfully experience what's happening. Just stay with it long enough for a minute or so. And then the partner can ask, what does my hand seem to be telling you? And the question is asked in a way that invites an answer from the unconscious. It's not conversational. It's, so what do you think, Sam? What do you think my hand is saying? It's feeling this hand. And you can imagine that you're doing it, I can tell. Feeling this hand on your back. What does this hand seem to be telling you? And something might show up in words, but it might also just change the feeling of the experience or bring a memory or bring an image. We're, we're not attached to what happens or even if anything happens because we're so trusting that this exploration this mindful exploration of our present moment experience and way of experiencing is going to be revealing and is going to open the door. It opens the door to consciousness. Consciousness brings choice. Choice is freedom. Wonderful. I love it. I've got so many thoughts about what you said. Um, I really love the sense of humans being learning through experience like every like so in order to heal needs to be experience like an experience needs to happen you can't just go oh yeah this thing happened now i'm good from up here it needs to be down here experiential which really makes sense that 
the methodology the whole way along is experiential and doesn't make any assumptions. It's like the client is building self-trust, curiosity about themselves. And I was thinking about like people who don't feel good about themselves who are being honored in a way which is like let's build you're not saying it but you're like let's build this trust and self-compassion for yourself in order to heal like what a empowering experience for a client this person in front of me seems to believe that i have this innate wisdom to heal myself it's like you know instead of like hey doc just tell me what i need to do to change this you know what i mean it's really wonderful yeah non-pathologizing empowering um let me jump yeah. in. Yeah, go for it. Uh, <clears throat> there's something that you pointed at um, that uh, Ron Kurtz used to refer to the missing experience. I, I've changed the languaging a little bit for a number of the things in Hakomi and and not so much changed the approach other than um, the integration part, which we'll get to, um, is, is more even more somatic in, in soma than, than it was in. And I, when I say somatic, I'm spelling it with a P, a silent P at the beginning, somatic than, than it was for Ron Kurtz. Ron Kurtz got amazing amounts of information about people from tracking the body and nonverbal expression. But then he would work uh, a lot with core beliefs and with insights and definitely with creating what he would call the missing experience. And uh, the missing experience, um, when someone is being related to by a person who is in, a, in loving presence, uh, appreciating them, seeing what's right, uh, welcoming, them feeling nourished and inspired by being with them that for many people is the missing experience that's what yeah was, like that as you were speaking yeah it's like the um the, the disconfirming or corrective experience perhaps of like wow i'm being i'm really being delighted in by this person which like a lot of people have never been delighted in i mean even when you started the session and reflected what you said it felt good inside to be like oh donna is noticing this thing about me it's already you know really you just feel good it feels good yeah, yeah. so i imagine yeah it can really disconfirm a lot of stuff just by the nature of the relationship yeah if if it if if they let it in if it lands and so what we're interested in is offering um everything that we offer starting with our presence, capital P presence, and every experiment we do is, is an offering of something that's potentially nourishing. But in the middle phase, in the exploration phase, we're offering, we want to offer something that we guess won't be taken in as nourishment. Because the missing experience is missing in present time, not because it's not available, but because it's not accessible because of our habits. So, for example, uh, I was working with a teaching a small group the other day. Uh, I do online trainings for for places like Estonia, for example. And uh, there was a woman who came back from one of the breakout rooms and a lot of our training and, and teaching in our events, you know, it's done with these experiential practices. So they were spending time in the breakout room and she came back and something had triggered her and she was very angry. And she talked, uh, as she talked about how angry she was, it was really coming out as anger. And it was uh, coming out with uh, statements like, you know, I know no, I, it's not okay for me to get, get angry. Well, one of the things I noticed about how she was organizing around the anger was she wasn't looking at me. She wasn't looking at anybody. She was looking here and looking there and looking down and looking here. And so I noted, I named that and, and invited to her to see what would happen if, if she looked at me while she was expressing the anger. And she burst into tears because she had never... She, in that moment, I, I'm not, I don't think she had, you know, I, I can't say she had never experienced this before, but she was experiencing a new 
awareness of it's possible to be related to with this anger without judgment and criticism. And she wouldn't have got that if she hadn't looked at me. I was offering it, but it was a missing experience for her as long as she continued her habitual way of organizing around the anger, which certainly was related to history and related to a core belief. It's not going to be okay with the other person if I'm angry or whatever. But what I'm paying attention to is what habits does she have now about how she's organizing this experience of hers that are interfering with something that would be nourishing? And can I invite her to experiment with something else? And for her, it just she was just ready. It just happened right away. Wow, brilliant. What a wonderful teaching moment for, for everybody witnessing that too. But you see, but your sense was I I I don't have a I don't have a like I'm pretending I'm you. I don't know what the outcome of this is going to be, but I want to invite an experience right now with this person. Who knows what's going to happen, but let's see. Can you look at me whilst you express this? And she did. And then that just all this meaning came up for her about anger. And and you also provided this sort of disconfirming experience like Donna can stay connected to me whilst I'm angry. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't have invited that. Sometimes if I'm in an in-person group, I'll look around and I'll see if, if you know, if a group has been together for some, some time. One of the beautiful things about this approach is it creates a kind of support group in the training you know it creates a kind of sangha almost and and people love each other and so if somebody's expressing something really distressing that they haven't felt safe to express before i i'll look around and i'll check the faces and then if if i'm confident i'll invite the person to look around because it's a missing experience it's a new experience to realize it's possible to be related to in a loving way, even when you feel like this, even when you're expressing this. But they would not access that nourishment if they continued to do things in the habitual way. And that, that, that feels like what my role is, is to notice and bring attention to and support a discovery of what the habits are doing and what else is possible. Wow, it's so it's um, so enriching. I, I love it. Um, I'm conscious of our time. I love so to how do, how, how do how do we wrap this up? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's like see if we can do like ten more minutes. Wrap this up in a perfectly coherent bow, so everybody knows exactly what soma is. <laughs> I'd love you, if nobody else, to to get one thing that I've uh, uh, arrived at from, from decades of experience, and especially with this real um, focus on the wisdom of the body and how much information there is for, for all of us when we become aware of what we're doing in our embodied embodiment, how we're embodying uh, different states, and, and the the awareness brings choice. And uh, what I'm watching for, uh, Sam, more and more with people is a, in, in a very simplistic way, I'll name it, but it can look more complicated than this, is uh, the contrast between a, an old pattern, which goes with their habitual way of organizing around some kind of suffering usually, and the emergence, which is almost always spontaneous, of, of something new that looks more resourced, that I'm calling coming home, that internal family systems would call big S self, that polyvagal that Dana might call ventral vagal, if nothing else, is a, is a resourced kind of, and sometimes it just emerges as a glimpse at first, but what I'm noticing more and more when I watch for it is that it does emerge spontaneously. And so it feels like part of what I'm doing is uh, once I've helped somebody uh, study and, and uh, just pay, pay attention to and actually make intentional something that they're doing 
uh, like a tension pattern, for example. Um, like uh, I worked with one fellow who, as he spoke, he kept shaking his head. Mm. You know, I, I want somebody to notice what it is they're doing and to study it until they come up with some awareness of, of what it means. Uh, in this case, when he slowed himself down and just did this movement, he he said right away, he said, oh, I, I, you know, it's uh, me tell me affirming you, you won't like me no matter what I do. There's nothing I can do or say that is going to make you like me. You're never, never going to, you know, he realized it and he almost laughed because it was so outdated, but it was still or organizing his um, unconsciously organizing his experience and revealing itself through that movement. With him, it was just so interesting because as we explored it and he had actually fun with, I had him, you know, do it on purpose, make it intentional. I usually start with that. So I don't suggest we're trying to correct it. We're just trying to learn about it. And then, and then I might suggest they do something else, you know, like not do it. Or I said, why don't you tell me that, you know, Donna, you, you won't like me no matter what I do, but nod while you're saying it, just as an experiment. And he did that and he cracked up and he totally, you know, he said, it's not possible. I can't, I can't say that and nod at the same time. I can't organize bodily around a, an attitude that I a story that's that's opposite to it you know I can't yeah. I can't feel nervous if I really I can't continue to feel afraid if I stand confident and move confidently self-aware uh, self-defense teachers know this so but then what I'm waiting for is as we chat about it and he's explored it and everything is I, all of a sudden, toward the end of the session, he's just without intentionally, he's just nodding. He's just he's just shifted. He's just shifted to a new resourced and 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 I think uh, moving back and forth between an old pattern and this new place is the best way for somebody to integrate what we've discovered in the session. And it gives them a, a takeaway. It gives them something to play with. There's going to be more awareness of the old pattern. He would go into a relationship and notice himself doing that. And he and he, he would have connect. Yes, he'll still do it because it's a habit and then auto, automatic, but he'll catch it sooner and interrupt it sooner and, and have, have uh, access to a resourced place that he knows. And he's going to shift to feeling what I call being more at home base, more at home in himself. That's, you know, you're, what you're describing sounds just like memory reconsolidation. The sense that this old knowing yeah. about, like, I know I'm doing this because I know Don is not going to like me. The mismatch detector fires up because he's experiencing your nourished position. And the two knowings, I'm being accepted and nourished and someone's being nourished doesn't fit with this person's not going to like me so he's like giggling like the brain can't handle both truths is that so, like well, this is know, this without, this go on. without having studied mem memory re reconsolidation i've had people say that it's uh, that sounds like when a guy i i think you know if something works it's going to show up in a lot of different methods and places and therapists are going to come to it in in their own way um, yeah. The way I feel, uh, and if any Hakomi people are are watching this, you know, I worked with Ron long enough to know that he never stopped refining and revising and changing uh, mm -hmm. the method. And he also wondered about the name of it. And uh, and I feel uh, I know he passed away in 2011, but I have his total support to do my approach differently in my own way and to call it soma uh, so uh, i want to honor ron for everything that he gave me and that hakomi offers to the world and the, clearly soma is founded in hakomi as it is in yoga and uh, so i'm immensely grateful for for that yeah 
yeah, it's nice that he, I, I imagine you being close, he gave you the nod to take it further in some way. Totally, totally. Named me in his will as a legacy holder. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's so meaningful. Yes. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, I wanted to make one more comment about what you were saying about this fellow and the sense that you weren't, you didn't have an opinion or perspective that one knowing was better than the was better than the other like you had this neutral standpoint of like well just say that to me and mm -hmm. see how it fits rather than well that's silly because I don't feel that about you it was like you invited the experiment rather than the assumption of like this is actually a preferred reality we should shoot for you're like just just play with it and then it was enough because I think if you would have said to him but I do like you you know he would have went all right. But you invited the experiment, which knocked him into his own agency about the original meanings and stuff, and then has allowed the body brain to do its thing itself, which is great. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's great that you recognize that essential point about this approach. I think it's this uh, supporting the exploration of something with that kind of uh, just simple curiosity and a mindful awareness. And it's not about trying to make something happen. It's not about when when we offer something. Uh, it can it might, we might offer a verbal statement of nourishment, but we don't offer it to try and make the person feel better. We offer it as a way of helping them become more aware of themselves. We want uh, the person to uh, be safe in relationship with us, but be paying attention to their own experience and learning from it, not from us. Mm -hmm. yeah so great yeah I'm conscious of time I, I'd love to talk about this for the rest of the day <laughs> but I wonder before we wrap up Donna what's like a good way for people to like get involved in Soma work and like do you recommend someone people finding a Soma clinician to experience it first and what trainings you have and all of that stuff I'm only, you know, I wanted to avoid getting involved in long trainings like Hakomi trainings will give people much of what I'm teaching. I, I'm a guest trainer in a lot of Hakomi trainings. I'm teaching retreats uh, like the one at Hollyhock. I'll be teaching an intensive in Taiwan in November. Uh, I, I've taught um, last last year. I, I taught in Spain in a training there. But I'm I'm not a lead Hakomi trainer anymore, and I'm of wanting to avoid getting involved in you know certification with Soma. Um, I really recommend that people look for Hakomi Hakomi Education Network. Uh, our trainings are all over the world. Uh, look for Feldenkrais Feldenkrais a uh, Feldenkrais added uh, class it really helps people understand the point of our whole organism learns from consciousness and we're we're uh, designed to be habitual but we're also capable of being creative and Feldenkrais is in a fa fantastic somatic uh, teaching around that and and I have a couple of books um, which you've probably named, but the, the Soma Yoga Therapy book um, gives a lot of description of and practices for this approach. And I'm currently um, finishing editing on a book called Soma, The Heart and Soul of Therapy. Great. That's so, so that, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, great. I think also actually saying that, I think on the experiential psychotherapies site which this will be on i think there is a couple of uh demo sessions that ron did for people to see too which may be a good way in but you have the book um and the retreat which sound great i'll see you in taiwan <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah anything you want to sh share any nuggets of wisdom before we wrap up you know i i think the whole point um, of what I, I would love people to get. Oh, yes, I'm also doing something for Japan. I used to go to Japan for many, many years and teach in person there, and I'm just doing online events for them now. But, um, you know, inner peace is, uh, is, is the starting place for, for 
peace in relationships and peace in the world. And it's such a, it's, it's so much in our face now these days, the, the need for peace and peacemaking. Um, trust yourself, trust the wisdom of your body, listen to your body and trust that bringing consciousness and choice to how you organize experience is going to actually bring you peace, peace in your relationships, and eventually spread to the rest of the world. It's all about peace. That's beautiful. What a wonderful sentiment to end on. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. Yeah, thank you so much. This was really wonderful. And thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And I, and I enjoyed the feeling like uh, like-minded spirits. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, yeah. Take good care. You too. Bye, Sam. Bye-bye.